Good morning and Merry Christmas. It is great to see you out today. I've had a couple of people say, Tim, this is a really strange Sunday. It's, you know, Christmas Eve following on the, you know, it's like Christmas has got here and gone because of today. All right. Trust me, it hasn't. Okay. We still have it to look forward to. How many of you know what the word Noel means? So that last song meant absolutely nothing to you, didn't it? But a beautiful job. All right. Um, I, I am here. You know, I've been going to Africa for the last five years, right? All right. And the primary language in the country that we go to is French. So I have expanded my French vocabulary because the word Noel is French. And what it literally means is Merry Christmas. So they were singing to you today, Merry Christmas. All right. It's connected to the first Christmas. All right. So sing Noel, Merry Christmas because of the first Christmas. So now that you've had that language lesson, thank you for being at New Hope Community Church on Christmas Sunday. We are so glad to have you here. We hope you'll come back on Christmas Eve. Uh, Tim Kepler will be with us, fresh from Japan. I talked with him this last week. He said his voice is about shot, but he will have a few days to recuperate before he gets here next Sunday. So we'll look forward to that. But we are glad you're here. If you are a guest today, if you came to hear one of these folks sing, uh, if you came because it's the Sunday close to Christmas, we're so happy that you are here. We have some communication cards in the pew in front of you. I would love for you to fill one out, drop it in the offering bag when it comes by. Let me take any fear you might have of doing that away. We promise we are not going to come knock on your door. We are not going to call you on the phone. But through the mail, we're going to send you information that tells you about the church, our staff, what we believe, and the services that are available if you are so interested in them. So we would love to put that information in your hands. Thank you so very, very much for doing that. Before I forget... If you are somebody who just loves really, really good Christmas music and you don't get your uh, fill of it today, then this afternoon at 2.30 at Clovis North, all right, high school in their theater there, their music theater. Um, I said Fresno and I was told in the last service it's Clovis, but it's a Clovis school in Fresno, all right, so, but it's Clovis North. And um, they are going to be doing Songs of the Season, and that begins at 2.30, and we have some folks from our church who are singing in that choir there as well. So if you want to go for some more good music, you'll be welcome to do that uh, this afternoon. January 7th, that's uh, just a few weeks from today, the first Sunday of uh, 2018, we're going to kick the year off right with having uh, baptisms during our two morning services, 9.15 and 10.45. We have about a dozen folks who are going to be baptized uh, the first Sunday of the month. And so uh, if you have received Christ in your life, but you have never been baptized and would like to be, you can take one of those same communication cards that I encouraged our visitors to fill out. You can pick one up and fill it out and check baptism on there. And this week, we'll get all the information to you, and we will follow up with you so that we can be ready for that very, very special Sunday on January the 7th. Um, if you are a Neonan sponsor for one of the kids, the junior high and high school kids that we are sponsoring in our village in Ivory Coast, Africa... Uh, you have pictures over in the office, all right? They're on the big counter there. Uh, look, go through the envelopes, look for your name. Uh, if, there are, if there are multiple people sponsoring one child, do they have pictures as well? Okay, so their name should be over there as well. So go look for your name and get the picture of your child. If you made a commitment and have not fulfilled that pledge yet, those were due, remember, by the end of the year. So you have just a couple of weeks to get that done. That's also true with our commitment to help Tim Kepler's ministry from Folsom to Forgiveness. And if you made a commitment to that, it would be great if you could get it in today because we'd like to give him that check next Sunday. We're going to give him one anyway, and we have to give him a second one at the end of the year. We'll do that as well. But uh, please, just a reminder for that. Most of you in here probably know the name Nancy Hines, don't you? All right. You're familiar with Hines Hospice Ministry. I doubt if there's hardly a family in the building who hasn't been impacted by uh, Heinz Hospice in one way or another. They've either cared for members of your family like they have for me. You've heard us tell stories about him here. Um, Nancy is, is one of my heroes. She's, in fact, probably in the top three of my heroes in the world. And um, as you know, Nancy retired a few years back. And uh, though she retired from the full-time uh, operations of Heinz Hospice, she did not retire completely from hospice work. Um, something that she started while she was running Heinz Hospice uh, was a prison ministry. She went to the Chowchilla Women's uh, Facility. 
You see, what people don't think about is people in prison get cancer. People in prison develop terminal illness. People in prison die in prison. And Nancy's heart is as big as the world, and she believes that no one, no one should not have peace when they die. She believes that everyone is entitled to dignity in the death process. She believes that comfort at that moment should be available to all. She has the heart of Christ working in her life. And when she retired from Heinz Hospice, she did not retire from her prison hospice work. She continues to go to Chowchilla. She goes in and trains inmates how to be hospice caregivers. Two things happen with that training. Those individuals become caregivers for those who are incarcerated who are dying. They are able to provide the same kind of care that we get out here, except it's inside prison walls. The second benefit is to the person who has been trained as a caregiver. If they have an opportunity to be released from prison, they now have a skill. They now have an employable skill. Well, what's happened is it's gone for more than just one prison. And some wardens have passed on the benefit that having a hospice program inside prison wall is. And so there is a national meeting of wardens taking place in the middle part of January in Florida. And Nancy has been invited as a guest speaker in front of all of the wardens in the U.S. to share about this hospice work. Well, Nancy is not part of Heinz Hospice anymore. She's retired. This is something she still does on her own. She doesn't have a, a 501c3 agency covering her. I just found out about this two weeks ago at Jane's house as we were having dinner with Nancy. And so I said, New Hope will come alongside to make sure that you and one or two of the inmates who've been released and are now doing this work on the outside that they learned on the inside could go and make this presentation. Can you imagine how God could put, penetrate into the darkest, deepest places in America inside our prison institution through Christ-centered hospice care? Would that not be incredible? And so I want to make sure that they get there. It's going to probably cost about $2,500 to get the two or three of them there, lodge for a couple of days, and back home again. And so I'm going to give you one more time to be gracious in your generosity before the end of the year. If you would like to come alongside and make sure that she's able to do what she has done for so many here and connect that with wardens all across the United States, just put something in an envelope. Uh, if you write a check, make it to New Hope, but on the outside of the envelope, write Nancy Hines, write Prison Hospice. Uh, we will make sure then that that gets to Nancy before the end of the year and she's able to make this trip. So thank you so much for letting me share that. Just before we get engaged in um, uh, the rest of our music today, let me highlight a few prayer requests. Um, many of you remember Jim Critchfield. Uh, Kathy's sitting right out here. She's now my neighbor. And uh, Kathy walked over last evening to tell me that one of Jim and her very good friends, Charlie, and his wife, Rita, Jim worked so hard to try to get Charlie and Rita into a relationship with Jesus Christ his last few years of his life. And um, just a little bit stubborn in that area. Well, Charlie called Kathy and asked if I would come visit Rita. She is, she's under hospice care. And basically asked Kathy if I'd come do my thing, all right, with, with Rita. And uh, it's not my thing, it's a Christ thing. And uh, Charlie needs to hear it just as much as Rita does. And so I'm gonna go, gonna go see her this afternoon. So would appreciate your prayers as we have uh, those visits. Pam Murphy is part of our church family. Her and her husband, Mike, uh, have been attending here for a while. Pam had the upper part of uh, one of her lungs removed this past week at the heart hospital. Was supposed to have gone home Friday, but there's been complications. I got a text late last night, and I'll be going to see Pam today. If things don't improve, they're going to have to do a second and a more dangerous surgery on Tuesday. And so would appreciate you remembering to pray for Pam and God's best in her life at this particular moment. Um, I also had a call this week, and I got a text just this morning from uh, this young man's mother. He's almost 30 years old. He spent six years serving his country. And uh, for the last four years, there's been a series of setbacks. Uh, most recently, he lost his job uh, with Pelco and cutbacks. Uh, a few months before that, his engagement came to an end. Uh, life just is not good for him. Um, he made some threats against himself. 
uh, this past Friday. Uh, we got some immediate help for him, and uh, we'll be visiting with him and his mom in, in, in this next week. And so would don't need to share his name with you right now. If you just remember to pray for that 30-year-old veteran, God's going to know who we're talking about. And then last of all, uh, a picture paints a thousand words, so let's put a picture up on the wall. That was Pop at 2 a.m. this morning. Um, that's when we left the hospital. He, uh, he fell about 5 o'clock last evening uh, getting his mail. Um, he, uh, he used his face to break his fall. And um, he had uh, just a stitch or two up by his eye. Everything else is just bad abrasions. Um, I could show you his hand, but it, it would not be pretty. Uh, he had about six, five stitches in his hand. And he had to cut away some skin because it just kind of peeled it back. So he'll have a wound to care for for a few days. So that's why you do not see him here today. Um, it was a, a very long night for him. And um, um, somebody said in the last service, do you notice one thing in that picture? He is smiling. Yes, I had a choice of two pictures, the before and the after. This is after, uh, before he hadn't had any uh, drugs yet. So this is, this is, this is, this is the after. Uh, he was uh, absolutely true. He never complained at all about pain, no matter how much they cleaned and daubed and, and irrigated. And um, so, um, but it was, uh, they worked on his patience, though. We went in at about 5.30, and it was uh, almost 2 when we left. So uh, just be praying for him and, and uh, his recovery over these next few days. All right? Uh, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward and wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, thank you for the life that uh, you share with us. Thank you for this season that gives us a pause in the normal routine of life and allows us to reflect on your love for the world. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. The Christmas story reminds us of, of, of love and of hope and of forgiveness and of family and of community. And so, Father, thank you for the pause in the routine of life that gives us a chance to rethink and maybe recalibrate our thoughts about things that are most important. I pray for your presence in our midst today as the message of Christmas is shared through both music and from your word that our hearts will be open to what you have to say to us. We're not concerned about what you should be saying to somebody else, but that we have very attentive ears for what you want to say to us. Thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing and meeting the needs of others. We do so, I trust, with great joy. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. If you guys want to get prepared in your Bibles, I'm going to be reading in a few moments from Matthew chapter 1. That's where we'll be focusing our attention on the Christmas story this morning. Uh, what I'd like to do, just as a few moments ago, I said a picture paints a thousand words, and I showed you a picture of my dad that wasn't all that pretty. I want to try to paint several thousand words with the next few pictures, if I can direct your attention to the screen behind me. Uh, what do we call that picture? The Nativity. Uh, there have been uh, thousands of nativity pictures that have been created since the very first nativity. Uh, some of you probably have set up nativities in your home with various sculptures and paintings and things. Uh, let's look at the next one. Uh, I've got four or five here. If you Google nativity, uh, thousands of prints will come up. Uh, this one's so much fun. It captures the whole story. The angels are there. Uh, the wise men are there. The shepherds are there. Uh, the sheep even showed up in this one. Um, let's look at the star. Star of Bethlehem is there. Uh, let's, let's flip to the next one. This one's for kids. It's there. It's coming. There, there we go. Look at that. Isn't that one? What do you notice about that picture? Palm trees, yeah, that's kind of weird, I guess. I don't know. Uh, they're all smiling, all right? They're all smiling. Even baby Jesus is smiling, all right? Uh, the, the little sheep looks like he's smiling. But anyway, well, I guess the one girl's not, but everybody's pretty happy. All right, look at this one. The camel decorated for Christmas. Uh, I love it. I love it. And, and then the last one, we'll keep up there for that. I love that. That may be my favorite. Look at Mary and Joseph smiling at their newborn baby. It is just absolutely beautiful. Um, I think what struck me as I looked at hundreds of nativity pictures this last week, the thing that struck me about most of them, and this one with just Mary and Joseph, really capture for me, is the idea of love and community. 
For God so loved the world that he gave. For Mary and Joseph so loved that they accepted God's will for their life, even when it seemed so very, very hard. There seems to be a wonder and a joy in Mary's eyes as she looks at this special birth. Joseph is holding Mary close with his hand on his shoulder. They are both filled with the joy and the anticipation of the future. You can sense a lot of love in this picture. In some of the other pictures we looked, there were shepherds standing nearby, and there were, there were wise men, though they really, in the real story, weren't there that first night. We sort of include them. And they stand with a look of wonder and amazement. In the pictures where there's cattle and sheep, I'm always amazed at how happy they look over the birth of baby Jesus. Um, as I looked at all these pictures, it made me wish that all family photos this Christmas could have such a sense of warmth and love and joy and wonder as this one does. Doesn't it make you wish that when you get together with your family this Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, or sometime during the Christmas season, and maybe you have a family picture, that it could have the kind of love at the core that this picture behind me demonstrates. Our family had a family picture scheduled for today right here on this stage in front of those trees at 2 o'clock today. We were doing that for a couple of reasons. One, it's Christmas. Number two, our son Brant arrived last evening. In fact, we pulled up in front of Dad's house just as I was getting the call about Dad's fall. So Brant, who had gotten on a plane at 525 North Carolina time yesterday, was with us at the hospital till 2 a.m. California time today. We were going to have the picture because all the arrangements had been made that everybody could be here. So the whole Roland family that Dad is the patriarch of was going to get the picture done today. We started running in some bumps in the road on Friday. Bo, the last one in the family to be added, uh, started vomiting, has the flu. The grand news is I got a call this morning or I got a text saying that Bo is just fine. Went by and saw him yesterday. He was better. He is doing perfect today. The problem now is Bo gave it to his father, Chad. And so Chad is now down with the flu. Um, Andrew, who had the day off, uh, had his work schedule changed Friday evening. He was now going to be working today. But not a problem with Photoshop. We had the spot where he was going to be in. We would have Photoshopped him in later. So the whole family would have been in the picture. And then... I'm not sure we want a family picture with the mug you saw earlier uh, in the service. We would have had to have had him turn left and got his right side, all right, to have made it look really good. But family photos with that kind of love and community, is, is that too much to ask for in any of our families? Is that holding the bar of expectation maybe a little too high? Today what I want to do on the time that we have is I want to try to show you the behind-the-scene price that Joseph and Mary paid in order to have a major scene picture turn out as beautiful as that one. You see, the working premise of today's message is that love and deep community that's captured in that photo is actually the result of several hard-fought battles that both Joseph and Mary had to engage in and win in order for this picture to be what it is today. I'm showing my hand in this sermon very, very early. I am suggesting that for your Christmas family photo, for my Christmas family photo, to communicate any level of love and community that comes close to that depth, probably everybody in the photo is going to have to engage in some similar personal battles that Mary and Joseph fought and won. For background content, I want to read the part of the Christmas story found in Matthew chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. Follow along with me or just listen if you prefer. Here's what's recorded. 
This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a what? Righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he showed her grace. He had in mind to call off their engagement quietly. He had the right to publicly humiliate her. That was his right by law. That was not his heart. See, sometimes our hearts must supersede the law. Joseph's did. After he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared in him to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. I, I think there's a subtle undertone in that message as well. That's, it's, it's Joseph, don't only be afraid to take her home, but don't be angry when you take her home. Because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus for he will save the people from their sins. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do and he took Mary home as his wife no longer afraid and not angry, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a child. No honeymoon. And he gave him the name Jesus. With this passage in mind as our background, let me describe the first of three battles we'll look at today. The first battle that Joseph and Mary had to fight and win in order for this manger photo that we looked at a moment ago and is still up behind me to look as lovely as it does. The first battle they both had to fight was the battle of righteousness, the battle for personal integrity. Look at the little phrase in verse 18 we just read together, but let me isolate the phrase, before they came together. Do I need to get that in the simplest form so you understand what it means? Before they had sex. Let me just clarify that, all right? I just unpacked it for you. As this passage says, Joseph and Mary were engaged, but not married. In our day, you can go in and out of engagement pretty easily. People make these arrangements rather privately sometimes. No one else really knows what's going on. But the betrothal system in the first century is more complicated than that. When you became engaged to someone, it was a public event. You went on public record in front of the entire village that you were part of and the announced engagement. It was a binding relationship for sure. This relationship would lead to marriage someday. We can assume that Joseph and Mary were in love with each other. Like many other engaged couples, they were committed to one another. They were fully intended to spend the rest of their lives together. Uh, but the Bible indicates in this one little phrase that they decided not to come together. Not to have sexual relationships until or unless they were married. You see, that follows both the desire of God for them and the law of God for them. What's so significant about this little phrase? Friends, in that day, and I suggest to you, even in our day to day, sexual purity is a battle. It doesn't come easily, it's lost very easily. They had to have a total commitment to personal righteousness. To honor God with their sexuality, especially in a loving relationship or engagement that was heading towards marriage. I mean, after all, in our culture today is, hey, why wait till the wedding? Let's just go ahead and buy a house, move in. Together. We're getting married in a few months anyway. What difference does it make? Not married Joseph. They were committed to this. Today, in like fashion, whether we're married or single, younger or older, we can fight for sexual righteousness we can fight for marital fidelity. We can even fight to make sure our minds stay pure with regard to sexual matters throughout the day. With God's help, we can win this battle. Not quite, quite what you figured for a Christmas Sunday sermon, was it? We can win this battle. Mary and Joseph did. Every one of us can. There's a lot of folks we've been reading about lately in the newspaper and hearing on the news that wish now that they hadn't lost the battle. With God's influence... As we win these battles for righteousness, not only in the area of our sexuality, but in areas of our life that call for integrity, we can wind up living with a clean conscience. 
We can live with a lifted spirit. We can live with peace that passes human understanding. Some of you right now have already begun to roll your eyes and shut me off. You're wondering to yourself, Tim, what in the world is the big deal whether I win this fight about righteousness or not? In this day and age, who cares? I mean, in a world like ours, millions of people every day taking the swan dive into the immorality of every kind. You're really expecting somebody like me to pray and strive and discipline myself and fight for personal integrity? Come on, Tim. 21st century, modern America. What's the big deal? Hang with me. This Christmas story reminds us that righteousness is a big deal to God. It's bigger than we ever could imagine. We also ought to realize that personal righteousness touches every relationship that we are in. Personal righteousness is a big deal, not just to God, but also the people in and around your life. I will say it as simply and directly as I can. Personal righteousness matters. Our sexual righteousness, our verbal righteousness, our financial righteousness, our ethical marketplace righteousness. This stuff matters in major ways to God. It matters in a major way to everybody our life touches. In fact, let me pose this question to you. Do you think that God would have chosen Joseph and Mary to be the key players in the incarnation drama had they been careless in regards to their righteousness? Do you think there's any correlation whatsoever in the commitment they had to personal integrity with God and God's decision to entrust them with the birth and the raising of the Savior of the world? Do you see any connect here? If you don't, you should. You should. There's always been a connect between righteousness and God's hand of favor and blessing. There's always been a connect with his decision to entrust somebody with a kingdom adventure. Do your research. Why was Abraham chosen to be the father of a great nation? Do your research. Why was Noah chosen to build an ark? Do your research. Why was David chosen by God to be his preference for the first king of Israel? Do not misunderstand me. These people were not absolutely perfect, but they had a passion and commitment to righteousness. And when they got off track, they quickly came back. Righteousness has always been important to God. Notice what uh, the loudmouth disciple Peter wrote in his first letter, chapter 3, verse 12, when he says, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to the prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love people who've lost their way. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want to reclaim lives that have gone astray. But God has favor and blessing on those who pursue righteousness. It means when he's looking for someone to pour his favor on, when he's listening for someone's cry, when he's trying to select somebody to give to them a kingdom adventure, he chooses the righteous. Those who walk in his way, to that end, My parents and a very good Sunday school teacher I had forced me to memorize a passage of Scripture I've not forgotten. It's not John 3.16. That's an easy one to remember. It's not Psalm 23, which as a chapter is an easy one to memorize. But it's Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of those who are mocking or scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on this law he meditates day and night. He or she is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in its appropriate seasons, whose leaf does not wither. It's an evergreen. Whatever he or she does will prosper, for the Lord watches over the way of the what? The righteous, if you didn't know the passage, the message ought to tell you probably what the word was. But the way of the wicked will perish. 
Sometimes I wonder if we would even know Joseph and Mary's name had they not fought and won the battle of personal righteousness. They may have been passed over uh, for an Esther and a John instead of a Joseph and a Mary. Sometimes with a trembling heart, I wonder what opportunities or adventures have been withheld from my own life because at times I've lost my righteous battles in embarrassing ways. Have you ever wondered about that for yourself? I mean, sometimes in the overall scheme of things, we forget that God has a world he's trying to reach And you and I are the kind of people he'd like to reach the world through. He's looking for some people who will walk in his ways that he can trust. Kingdom responsibilities and redemptive adventures to personal righteousness is a big deal. And it always has been with God. When you're committed to personal righteousness, it approves our heart of devotion to God. It demonstrates our trustworthiness before him. It makes us eligible for a kind of favor and blessing that he reserves for those who want to cultivate and pursue this thing called righteousness. Maybe some of you want to do a righteous inventory today. You want to do what David did a long time back when he got off track, when he wrote these words, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me. And when David said that, he knew there was. He knew exactly what it was. And then he says, I want to make it right. Listen very closely to what I'm about to say next. It occurred to me this week that some of us, some of us might not get Christmas right this year until we make something right in our relationship with God. There is something we have held in reserve from him And we will not fully enjoy this Christmas until we get that right. Maybe we are at odds with somebody in our family or our world. And Christmas just won't be right until we make it right. For us to get Christmas right, we're going to have to make something right. Now we can postpone it, we can delay it, we can bury our head in the sand and say, I don't know what you're talking about. Or we can step up and engage in the battle of personal righteousness. I would suggest that we start the battle today. Choose to say, okay, I'm going to make this right with God. By God's grace, I'm going to make this right with that person that I've been at odds with. Be reminded that on the other side of righteous victory is a clear, clean conscience. There is a freed spirit, a sense of peace. I hope Joseph and Mary's righteousness victory and all that came their way as a result of it will inspire us this morning to get this Christmas right by making something right with God or someone else. And we need to initiate it. Let's look back at the manger scene because there's another hard-fought battle that Joseph had to fight in order for this picture to look as warm and loving as it is. You see Joseph there? He looks relaxed and joyful at the moment. But this wasn't always true in Joseph's life, in his battle for grace. It was a hard-fought battle. A lot of people don't understand what Joseph went through on this whole Christmas story, so let me retell the story in a little more modern setting, if you will, so you can get a little sense of the texture and the flavor of what this guy Joseph went through. Imagine living in a small town where all the kids go to the same school. Everybody in town goes to the same church. They haven't had one fight and split yet. Isn't that amazing? Everybody pretty much votes the same way in the local elections. The highest value in this village is traditional family values. Very conservative town. You're engaged to be married to the pretty young maiden who everybody in the village knows very, very well. They know that this woman is not just a pretty young woman. She is godly too. She likes the local, she's kind of like the local church homecoming queen. And the upcoming wedding is the talk of the town. It's the social event everybody can't wait to attend. You feel the eyes of the village on their courtship. You know how important it is for you to get it right so you put on a clinic when it comes to dating. This young couple spend all of their time together with her family or his family. They walk and talk in public places only and there are not any PDAs. If y'all don't know what that is, ask your neighbor. That means public displays of affection. There's none of that between these two. It's because you know the whole village is watching. You want to both live up to a personal spiritual conviction, and whatever you do, you're not going to disappoint the people of that little town. You're not going to risk their anger because you've got to live there for the rest of your life. Well, one night, you're bringing your pretty young woman that you're engaged to to her doorstep. 
She leans over and whispers in your ear and she says, before you go, Joseph, you should know I'm pregnant. And you cringe because nice girls don't even joke about stuff like that. And then your mouth gets dry and your stomach starts churning because you can see in her face she's not joking. What comes next is a kind of internal boiling rage welling up inside of you because you know that you are not the father. You've never even kissed her. You haven't touched her in any way. You've never been alone with her in private, but obviously someone else has been alone with her, which spells a kind of deception and betrayal you didn't think existed in the world. Your blood turns cold. Two words seesaw back and forth in your mind. Pregnant father. Who is the father? You're running down a list of names in town that might be the guy. Now look at this paragraph buried in the story. In verse 19, it says, because Joseph was a, what kind of man? Because he had won the battle of righteousness, he could begin to win the battle of grace. He did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He decided, I'll back away quietly. I hope you can grasp the weightiness of this phrase. Shortly after the most devastating betrayal of a young man's life, Joseph tries to figure out a way he can deal with his disappointment and not slam dunk Mary. Do you think what he did, he did just out of reflex? Do you think that was his first normal reaction to this news? Do you think this kind of kindness was natural for him? I doubt it. I think jo Joseph had a battle of rage to contend with before he got to graciousness. I think he had to fight to get from disappointment and the feeling of betrayal to a place where he wanted to preserve and protect Mary. This doesn't come natural to most of us. I'll just speak for myself. I have some moments in my past I'm not proud of. When people betrayed me, when they treated me in ways that were hurtful to me and others that I loved, my reflex reaction is hurt back. I've wanted to say sometimes, hey, you see how that feels? That's how you made me feel. I can just bet Joseph, when he first got the news that Mary was pregnant, I bet he considered other options first. I'll bet he considered dragging Mary in front of the whole village, which was his right by law to do, and saying with a voice dripping with sarcasm, so you all think Mary's the poster child for morality? Ha! You think she's the cover girl of traditional values? She's pregnant and it's not mine. She's deceived me and you as well. Surely that option floated around in Joseph's mind. This side of heaven, every human being who's been wronged in some way is tempted to slam dunk whoever it is that has wronged us. But Joseph didn't act on first impulse. Joseph dug deep and he pushed the pause button. Oh, if we could use the pause button more often. And he began to pray. He opened his mind, his heart, and his hands to God, saying, God, in this terribly disappointing, confusing situation, what would you have me do? Maybe he even slowed his spirit to a point where he would seriously wonder, if I were in Mary's shoes, how would I like to be treated? Would I want to be exposed, disgraced, and humiliated? Or, or, or would I hope and pray for just a little understanding and grace? All right, time out from the story for a second. Let's bring this right here to Clovis. I know some of you all live in Fresno, but at the moment, you're in Clovis. So let's bring it right here. A few days from now, you're going to get together with your family. Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, day close to those two days. In the same room with you are going to be some people, most likely, who have hurt you in some way, betrayed you or wronged you. I mean, this side of heaven, that stuff happens, right? I mean, does that ever happen in your family? Okay. Even in good families. Not everybody gets it right all the time. There's some hurt somewhere. So at this year's Christmas party, like Joseph, we have a decision to make. We can act on our dark impulses that make us want to inflict damage or hurt people who have wronged us. And sometimes we do this in rather sneaky ways, but we get it done. Or we can choose to follow the lead of Joseph. We can engage in the battle of graciousness, and we can maybe even wrestle with God for a while about what the higher road would be to take, and maybe we can treat somebody with grace instead of judgment. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying if we're Christ followers, it's something we need to do. I wonder what would happen to the family gatherings of everybody in Clovis if we all decided to renounce being jerks. 
if we all decided that we would grant forgiveness to others in the manner it's been granted to us through Jesus Christ. Your parents have probably wronged you at some, some moment in life. More than likely, you deserved it. Your, your brothers and sisters have probably not batted a thousand along the way in the way they've treated you. How long are you going to make them pay? How long are you going to hold that over their heads? How long are you going to extract a price from them? At what point do you look at a blood-stained cross, which I would show to you if that was up, but I want that picture there. When are you finally going to say, I was forgiven for a mountain of moral debt and motivated by God's forgiveness to me, I now choose to renounce being a jerk. I now choose to renounce exacting prices out of people who have wronged me. I now proclaim grace and declare forgiveness to those who have wronged me. I know in some cases you've been wronged in some startling ways, and it's going to take more time than we have between now and Christmas Eve to get it sorted out. It might even take some counseling. I'm not saying it'll be easy, but I am telling you this, it's necessary. It is necessary. When does the cycle of meanness end and the kindness cycle begin? Let it be you. Let it be me. Let it, let it be all of us at New Hope today. Let us be the ones who say, we've been forgiven by Jesus for so much, we are going to be graceful in the way in which we treat others. After Joseph started to take the high road, he decided, all right, I'm not going to publicly slam dunk Mary. I'm not going to disgrace her and expose her. Immediately after that, the Bible says in verse 20, an angel appears to Joseph. When our heart is right, God can speak to us. When our heart is right, we listen. And so an angel shows up and gives him the news that Mary was not immoral. Mary did not betray him. In fact, he was wrong all the way around. The Holy Spirit touched her womb in a supernatural way. The long-awaited Messiah was now here. How glad Joseph was when he got that message that he hadn't brought her to the village and discredited her and humiliated her. Can you imagine how glad he was that he gave her grace? How would that marriage have gone on if he hadn't? shown grace. I have never regretted once in my life actions that I've taken that were filled with grace and kindness. I have not looked back once at something I've done, even if it didn't turn out in a good, positive way. I've slept well at night. But I have certainly experienced regret when I have demonstrated a lack of grace and I have done acts of meanness. Every time I've worked and engaged vigorously in the battle of graciousness under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, every time I've canceled the debt and let somebody off the hook and decided to bless instead of curse, that is where I found satisfaction in my soul. You will too, guaranteed. The angel ends his communication with Joseph by saying, take Mary to be your wife. Finish through on your dreams. You've been selected to head up the family that will will raise the Savior of the world. That brings us to the last battle, and it'll take just a minute to cover this. This is the battle for trust. This is the battle that almost pushes Joseph to the very edge of his faith because the battle for trust forces Joseph to come to terms with his willingness to walk by faith and not by sight. See, sight would have caused him to have left Mary in public shame. Faith enabled him to raise her up to the highest place in our world today. How do you walk in life? By how you see and how you feel? Or do you walk by faith in the confidence of God's leadership in your life? When people in that little conservative Jewish village hear that Joseph named his baby Jesus, that took Trust on Joseph's part. Because the name Jesus means the Savior of the world. And all those other Jewish parents knew what the name Jesus meant. And Joseph still went ahead and called his baby Jesus. All of us have a battle with trust. 
We have a battle with trust at this time of year about this whole Christmas thing. Is it really real and true? Everything that the scripture says, I mean, did it really work that way? We're being asked to believe that at 30 years of age, Jesus began a public ministry where he healed, comforted, and challenged, and taught people. And at the end of a three-year ministry, he was crucified on a cross between two common thieves. We are asked to believe that three days after that crucifixion and death, he was resurrected and later he ascended to heaven. You and I are asked to believe that he did all that so we could have forgiveness of sins and that we could go to heaven when we die. Do, Do you believe all that? Is that too much for you to believe? I hope not. God wants us to believe this. Do do we believe it enough to stake everything in our life on that truth? Do we believe it enough to share that truth with others who have never heard it or who have previously rejected it? Beyond that, God is asking even more from us. This Christmas, some of you are facing medical challenges that have you scared spitless. Some are facing financial shortages they didn't expect and prepare for. Others are having vocational setbacks and family heartbreaks, and God is asking those of us who are facing every, every difficult situation this Christmas to believe that he is a God who loves to do good, that somehow, some way, he's going to orchestrate all these circumstances into a plan that winds up being good for you. At eight last night, when a doc poked his head into the ER room and said, I'll be here in a few minutes. We'll get your dad fixed up and out of here. I thought, all right, I'll be home by nine. I'll be in bed by 10. This is good. This is good. 10 came and went. 11 came and went. A a PA stuck his head in and my dad said, is there anybody here? The guy said, I'm sorry, Mr. Rowland. He said, he said, I'm sorry to keep you waiting so long. Here's my dad. This is, this is my dad through and through. He said, I'm not worried about me. I'll be just fine. But my son has to preach three Christian Christmas sermons in the morning. He needs to get to bed. That's dad. We're sitting there. People are coming in and out. I said, dad, his dad sometimes when nobody was in the room would be a little less patient. I said, Dad, this just means there are other people in other rooms who have worse injuries than yours. He said, I know, I know. I kept sitting there thinking, okay, God, where's the good going to come out of this? The nurse who had been in and out, a blonde nurse, been in and out of the room. She'd cleaned Dad's wounds. She was so kind, so gracious as she took care of Dad. We're wrapping up now that he's stitched up. They're getting us the paperwork. They're going to get a wheelchair to take him out. It's 135. And the nurse says, um, where are you going to be preaching those three sermons? I said, ah, it's a church on knees called New Hope. She said, I got married there. She says, but right now I'm going through a divorce. I should have plugged in somewhere to a church a long time ago. It's too late to save this marriage. What time are your services? It was at that moment, walking out of that hospital at about 1.40. I said, God, thank you for not allowing me to speak my impatience in that room. Thank you for somehow restraining me from whining or complaining. Because it took that entire time for that young woman to get the courage to ask for just a little kindness. God is good. How are we dealing with the battles of righteousness, of graciousness, and of trust in our life? I guess I'm here to tell you this morning that today is our day to engage in these battles if we've been putting them off. If we're going to get Christmas right this year, we need to get right with righteousness and grace and trust. We need to choose Jesus first. He'll help us get our marriages right, our families right, our friendships right, our church right, our marketplace right, our nation right, and most important of all, eternity right. 
But we're going to have to become more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. This is not a layup or a slam dunk. We must choose how we're going to respond to the world. I'd like to ask you to take one last look at the Christmas child. I'm going to ask you to stand as you take that look on the screen behind me. I want you to see Jesus in the manger. I want that to be the last thing you look at before we go. It's a little bit staggering to think about it. That baby that you see there, that is the Savior of the world in a bed of straw, hay. That is the hope of the human race who came as a child. But when I look at that scene one last time, here's what I'm thinking. I am glad that Joseph and Mary fought the behind-the-scene faith battles that they did and give us a glimmer of hope that we can win in our life. No matter what our failures have been in the past, we can begin to win today the battles for righteousness and grace and trust in our own lives. This is the year 2017 for just a few more weeks. And this week, we have seven days before Christmas Eve. I hope and pray every New Hope person, every one of us here, will choose to get into the fray so that righteousness will govern our behavior, graciousness will direct our responses, and trust, trust will give us the courage to share our faith with others. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the story of Christmas. Thank you for the way it was revealed to us in music today. Thank you for the way it's been depicted for centuries in pictures. And thank you most of all for the rock-solid record we have in Matthew and Luke of how all this happened. Thank you that you loved us and you now want to demonstrate your love through us. May we surrender our unrighteousness and exchange those old garments that are now filthy rags and exchange them for the robe of righteousness that you've bought for us, you've cleaned for us, you have hanging in your closet ready to give to us when we say, God, I want to be dressed with you. May we learn through righteousness to be grace-filled to others, and may we live daily in the confidence of trust in you, that you are a God who is good, and your best is what you want to give to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. See you Christmas Eve. Service tonight at 6 o'clock. Come and join us.